Um, this is uh, honestly amazing and awesome to see how many people come out to these meetups. Um, we've been to a couple around the DC area that pale in comparison to this. So this is really exciting. I was talking with Drew a little bit earlier just about how Calgary just has this buzz about analytics and data science and AI that's, that's really great and it's exciting to see that starting to bubble up and, and really take hold. So um, Drew, thank you for getting my impressive title out there so everyone thinks that I'm all stuck up about it. I appreciate that. Um, we uh, are going to talk to you about three different perspectives on data science. Um, I am, uh, my, in my role, I manage our data science team. I manage a number of our accounts and projects. So I'm really coming at it from that higher level perspective. My colleague, Sean Osis, who is based here in Calgary, uh, will be talking about more of the tactical and some of the soft skills around data science projects. And then uh, Priya Karanth, who's a recent addition uh, to Mosaic and who actually got connected up with Sean at one of these meetups, and that's how she ended up joining the Mosaic team, which is pretty cool. Um, she's going to talk about uh, a hands-on application. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, you know, for, uh, well, actually, let me do a little survey here. Uh, how many people in here are uh, full-time students, undergrad, graduate, handful? OK. How many um, people would say that they have a full-time job that is uh, a technical job related to data science, AI, anything like that. Okay. How about folks in more um, uh, management roles related to data science analytics? Handful. Other interested observers? <laughs> okay, cool. Good. Well, hopefully they'll find a little bit of, of uh, something for everybody here. Um, just a quick background on Mosaic. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but we're a small company, about 80 people. We provide data science and um, uh, AI and analytic services, uh, working with a wide range of customers. And so we go into a lot of different organizations that are at very different places on that spectrum of uh, maturity around analytics and how they're approaching the problem. So hopefully we can share a little bit of that with you. Um, also, plenty of food available. So if you haven't gotten any, please get that. I'm hoping that the more you're eating, the more amazing my talk will seem. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this slide up here. This is just for my piece of it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a particular trend that has been on my mind a little bit. I'll be totally frank. Uh, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to process some thoughts I had around what's happening with decentralization of data science. Um, and so I'm testing these ideas on you guys. But I'd love to hear feedback and questions and comments. Um, for those that are more technically oriented, you can sleep through this part and then wake up when Sean comes up. All right, so see if this works. No? OK, so I just want to give you a, a very quick look at my background, because I think it really shapes how I think about these issues and how I talk about these kinds of things. And that's not working still. Let's see. Do we have another mouse we could use? Oh, there it is. OK. So my background, um, I came out of the world of operations research, supply chain, logistics, optimization. Okay? And I came into data science as uh, seeing those as tools that were part of this bro broader problem-solving tool uh, toolkit. Um, so that included looking at these optimization models that I was developing and realizing that the optimization problem was solved. The issue was we had uh, no idea of what was actually going to happen in the real world. And so trying to optimize with a huge amount of uncertainty and really terrible forecasts, uh, the, the, the big um, gain to be had, the big opportunity, was with improving those rather than improving the optimization model itself. Um, so that definitely uh, has shaped the way that I think about um, these kinds of uh, tools and techniques and where the world of data science and AI is going. Uh, my role is always lean towards uh, what I'll call an operational data scientist. Um, if you haven't, uh, let's see, there's a, a, a um, O'Reilly publication called uh, Care and Feeding of Data Scientists that uh, talks about the difference between operational data scientists, product engineering. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting read. It's a fast read. Um, it's oriented more towards managers. But I think it's really relevant for anyone to take a read to see, um, you know, even if you are a technical contributor, you want to know what you should be asking of your managers and bosses to do with you and for you. And um, so uh, I highly advise that. Again, care and feeding of data scientists. Forget the fact that it's a little bit offensive that they're comparing us to um, to uh, farm animals, but that's all right. Uh, all right, so why should you care about the background? As I said, the experience uh, shapes the perspective. And so I'm going to be talking about this from that perspective of data science uh, as it feeds into that uh, operational role. Um, that may be very different than a lot of you who may be in here thinking about all the cool new AI applications that are out there and experimenting with really cutting edge, bleeding edge stuff. From my perspective, it all um, needs to, to push back into uh, things that are effective for the businesses and the customers that we're working with. Okay, so it may be a little bit different than some of your ideas that uh, you're coming in with for, for AI. 
A lot of trends out there. You can Google any article on trends in data science. There's a bunch of them I won't talk about. Those are just a handful of them. Um, it's good stuff to learn about and to be aware of. Um, but uh, what I want to focus on today, whoops, can you click back for me, is um, what we're seeing as trends of decentralization of data science within organizations. And in particular, I want to tie that to what it means for the people in this room. Um, and we'll talk a little about the career path that that's now uh, creating and, and, and changing that process. Um, so hopefully that, that, uh, that's something that you find relevant. Um, so I, I'll call it the traditional model, operating model of data science, uh, was to centralize the data science function, right? We have um, all of our data scientists are going to be sitting in one group, maybe reporting up through uh, IT or maybe reporting up through um, the CFO or some, uh, some uh, group like that. Um, and what it means is that uh, it's an efficient way to prioritize resources. And in this particular case, the scarce resource was the data scientist. Okay, so think about four or five years ago how there were so many articles about uh, the, uh, the shortage of data scientists and how that's, that's the new opportunity. Um, and everybody's looking for data scientists, but nobody can find them, right? Back in the age of the unicorn data scientist. So if, if you're a centralized team, it makes it much easier to prioritize your, um, what you're working on for those, people, um, those resources. Um, it can still be a great model that's out there that's used uh, organizations new to data science, right? As you're just starting to move forward, you're just hiring your first people, your first data scientists. Well, you gotta be careful that, that uh, you know, they're working on the right thing, so maybe you wanna have a centralized model, right? Uh, smaller organizations, uh, you may not have the capability of, of building up a whole decentralized distributed group of data scientists. Um, and uh, interestingly, I've seen a lot of this in, organi or in uh, heavily in regulated industries where control over the outputs of models and the way that data is being used is uh, given a priority. Uh, and there's a lot more push in those cases to have a, a centralized data science team, right? Now that's different than saying a centralized data science strategy, which we'll talk about in a moment there. Um, distributed data science, so uh, you know, one of the big, shorted, or big uh, challenges for centralized data science teams, you're operating at a remove from the business, right? You're not there on the front lines seeing how the business operates. And so to a certain extent, you've got to have the business use cases and the opportunities bubble up to you. Um, and so that means there's a lot of opportunities that are missed. Uh, you're not right there working with those end users, um, the, those people that are on the front line working with customers. And so that can cause some, uh, some missed opportunities there. Um, but what's happening? Data science skill sets are becoming more prevalent. All right, there's a lot of people in this room that are studying analytics right now. Uh, there are tons and tons of master's programs and PhD programs are becoming more focused on that. If you are somebody with a technical skill set and the motivation, there's so many resources out there for you to develop your own school skill set. Uh, and that, along with that, the new tool sets that are out there are giving folks like analysts, engineers that are already in the business an entry point into advanced analytics, data science, AI, right? And I think you see that in this room, that there was a, a lot of hands raised for that interested observers, right? Well, there are opportunities for, for people to move into this, into this industry. So all that means that there's a lot more people that are doing data science or can be doing data science within any given organization. And so uh, what has happened in many different organizations is that uh, there are data scientist roles that are being created associated with sitting in the different lines of business. So rather than now being in a central data science organization and you just get shopped out for a quick project, uh, you now have data scientists that are sitting there day to day. They are part of the pricing team. I am a data pricing data scientist. They are part of the HR organization. They may be reporting directly up through that organization. Uh, the other thing that you'll see is that um, you have, uh, you're seeding your data scientists with those functional teams. So even if you're not reporting directly up with, uh, through there, even if you're reporting through some uh, chief data scientist or um, a CAO, CAO, CAO organization, um, they, uh, you're spending your time, you're sitting with, uh, in the business, and you're able to get access to those problems that are being solved. You know that data very well. You know the business processes, right? So we're seeing a lot more of this. And of course, there are trade-offs in all of that. So uh, before we get to that, though, why, why do I think you should care today? In general, you, you, you may want to you know, you may be thinking about organizational efficiencies and things like that. But for today, I want to focus on the fact that um, this has a big impact on the career paths that are available to data scientists. So uh, the lack of or unclear career growth opportunities has been the number one reason cited by data scientists when they leave their roles. Okay, so forget all the messy data and the bureaucracy and all the other things that you deal with as a data scientist. Forget the fact that there are companies out there that are coming in with these great offers with ridiculous salaries and all those kinds of things. 
it is the lack of the career growth opportunities that is most often cited. Okay? Um, why is that? I, what we've seen in a lot of cases is that organizations just don't know what to do with data scientists who want to move up in their careers. There's just not an understanding or, or a, a good um, model for where they fit in the organization once they move up from being a, uh, an individual con contributor. So uh, the continuing decentralization that we're talking about, though, implies that there's now a very different data science career path that's available to data scientists. So traditional career paths are not going away. That idea of, uh, you know, if you're in that centralized organization, you develop your skill set, you can be uh, an all-star uh, individual contributor, you can move into data science management. But what's happening now is that there are new opportunities within those lines of business. Because those data scientists are sitting there, they are impacting daily decisions. They are part of the teams that are deciding how are we going to solve our hardest problems as a business. All of a sudden now, you're in a role where you can move up through that part of the organization instead. In addition, there is so much more value now placed on uh, analytical skill sets in managers and leaders. Right? You have to be able to interpret data. You have to be able to understand how AI tools fit into the broader set of solutions we have. You are managing that trade-off or that uh, balance between the intelligence that's coming from these tool sets and your people. How do they interact together? At what points can we, uh, can we substitute one for the other? Um, where can we be more efficient with uh, our, our human decision makers if they are enhanced with the insights from these kinds of tools? So that's a whole different path now where all of a sudden people are valuing those skill sets that previously were seen as the domain of IT, but then IT didn't really feel so comfortable because you weren't managing large platforms and systems, and so you, know, you weren't really welcome there either, and so it kind of became this, this uh, a, a difficult situation in a lot of organizations. So centralized data science team versus distributed data scientists. Uh, there are trade-offs, obviously, in that. So centralized team, uh, it's much easier in most cases to be uh, sharing technical knowledge, learning from each other on the team. They, you're seated together, you uh, are in your stand-up meetings together. You have that opportunity to see what other people are doing and to uh, figure out where your skill sets can uh, most um, valuably be enhanced. Uh, whereas once you're distributed, well, if I'm sitting out in the pricing team and maybe it's me and a business analyst and then a bunch of um, folks that came up through that part of the organization, it's more on me now to figure out how can I make those connections. Okay? We'll talk about some mixed models that, that help to, uh, to bridge that in just a second. Um, if you're centralized, though, you're getting that censored, filtered view of the business operations. You're seeing what's relevant to whatever you're working on right now. Uh, you're seeing whatever problems are surfacing to you um, from uh, wherever those, those use cases are being brought in. Uh, versus if you're sitting with the line of business, obviously you have a much closer view of the day-to-day -day business operations. You have that opportunity to identify, here are places where my skill set can help. I can help define our priorities as a group, and I can make sure that analytics are core to that. Um, oftentimes, with the centralized data science team, the heavier emphasis is on the product and engineering skills, so thinking about your own career path. Um, this is where you're often having to uh, build and maintain the platforms where you're productionalizing and scaling enterprise scale applications related to data science. And so there's a much heavier um, requirement for being able to write production code and do all of the, um, the kinds of, uh, of, of um, tasks that are related to that, versus if you're in the business, you've got to be able to communicate with the business. You've got to understand the operations. You have to be able to do the analysis to even get to the point where you say, this is the right problem for me to be working on. So there's a heavier emphasis there on those communication skills, the operational knowledge. Um, so career paths then, well, typically, or most often, I guess I'll say, the centralized data science team, your career path is going to be individual contributor, data science manager. Those are kind of the two tracks you usually see, right? Versus now, if you're uh, out in the business, you can still follow that individual career, uh, individual contributor path in many cases, but now you have this operational and functional manager and leadership roles that are now opened up to you that previously were very difficult to access for data scientists and analysts. So uh, obviously, it's not just one or the other centralized versus distributed. And so the center of excellence model is uh, an attempt to kind of bridge between the two of those. It looks very different from one organization to the next. and so. Um, if you if move from one to the next, you may see that there's um, more ownership of particular uh, individual projects. Some of them look more like centralized teams versus others that look like they're just kind of a, a clearinghouse. But essentially what's trying to happen is that you're trying to match the top down and the bottom up, right? Top down meaning you have that uh, executive sponsorship, you have that centralized ownership of the strategy around analytics and data science to make sure the organization is, uh, is, is um, 
approaching those problems and leveraging those skills and leveraging the data in a, in a way that makes sense with your uh, larger organizational goals. Uh, standardization on platforms and best practices, so helping to support those data scientists that may be working in different parts of the organization to make sure that where possible there's that uh, ability to transfer knowledge and transfer tools across those. Organizational maturity, making sure that the business customers are being educated, building that data literacy, right? So there's still that centralized uh, ownership of the strategy, but then the business owns the projects, may have de dedicated data scientists or these dotted line reporting, meaning that uh, somebody who's actually just seated with the business, but now that person, the data scientists themselves, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, are responsible to the managers and the lines of business. So it's kind of a, it's attempting to get a best of both worlds there, and as I said, there's a balance that, um, that is struck at different places for different organizations. Um, so it can provide all the career path options of both centralized and distributed models, right? It's a mix of the two, but it doesn't always. Uh, and what I want to speak to just a little bit is what that means for you now. Okay, so what does it all mean for you? Think hard about your desired career path, all right? Don't just assume, I want to be a data scientist, and so I'm just gonna drop in somewhere and be a data scientist, and I'll figure that out later, because your, your, your paths available may be very different from one organization to the next. Um, ask questions, okay? Ask questions about how is data science structured in the organization? Uh, I think a lot of people that are coming out of grad school aren't aware of some of these differences, so make sure you're asking and saying, where, where am I actually gonna sit? Day to day, who am I reporting to? Who am I talking to? How, if uh, it's a distributed team, what support is there from the center of excellence to help me interface with other data scientists, help me develop my skill sets? Um, specific career paths. Uh, most organizations should have some idea of what those possible career paths are. You may not need to decide right now which one you're on, but you better be pretty confident that the right one is there for you when it gets to that point where you're going to differentiate from just being an initial contributor. Um, understanding the expectations for the different rungs on the paths. So at some point, there'll be that differentiation. What am I expected to do to become a uh, data science manager versus if I'm going to be in a more functional role and moving up into, into those rungs? Um, when do I need to start specializing? When am I locked in? Uh, and making sure that I'm reporting to the right person to manage my desired path. So who I'm reporting to, that's also the person that's also really responsible for me uh, moving up and, and making sure that I'm uh, getting to these different points in my career. So making sure that the organizational structure aligns with your desired path, and then working with your manager to make sure your path is clear and that you have those, those right milestones. I think that's a really key part. Um, I think that there's a lot of that initiative that, that has to fall on you to go to your manager and say, okay, I understand that you know, my next level up is gonna be senior data scientist and then lead data scientist and then et cetera, et cetera. What are the very specific things? Are they documented? If I'm going on an individual contributor path versus a manager path versus I wanna move up in the business part of the organization, I wanna understand up front, how, how are the, how's that already documented? What do I, uh, if, if I'm not clear on what those milestones are, um, I wanna work with my manager and make sure that they're gonna take the time and energy to make that clear for me and help me build that. All right, so uh, those are my thoughts. Um, any uh, questions at this point before I hand it off to, uh, to Sean? It's all quiet. All right, you're aboard. Yeah? Uh, can you provide some examples of the center of excellence which, that we can reference for future use? Uh, examples in terms of yeah, absolutely. So the center of excellence model is, is used not just for analytics, it's used in a lot of places. But if you look up uh, organizational models for data science, it'll show you a bunch of different ones. There's an old Harvard Business Review article that I actually found was the clearest and actually charted out the different organizational structures related to that. Um, and uh, I, I think the key thing to understand there is that it's, it's, it, it lands in a very different place for different organizations. And so some places that still really looks like a centralized team that just for project, one project at a time, you're getting sent out. Other places, it really is that you're housed in, as a data scientist, you live in the business, but the center of excellence is uh, providing resources and programs to help people develop, um, but you're not actually directly interacting with those other people on a day-to-day -day basis. So, yep. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah. What are the best tools to have in your toolkit? The best tools to have in your toolkit? Yep. Uh, wow. Um, what, what do you, what, I guess, from, from whose perspective? From where, where, who am I answering that question, I guess? Is that as a, hmm. I, I don't know how to, how to answer that uh, generally. So, uh, you know, R and Python are just so prevalent that ha starting with one of those tools 
and using that as a platform to learn upon by going out and finding resources related to that. Um, I think it's really important to get comfortable with a lot of the um, techniques and concepts that translate though across models, you know, understanding very closely things like overfitting and underfitting and cross-validation, um, how to do feature selection. Um, you know, if you are going to eventually move into the world of deep learning, that's great, but there's a lot of those core skills and core techniques um, that translate across all of those that eventually once you learn those, it makes it very easy to say, well, this is R, this is Python, it doesn't really matter to me, I know how I need to structure this, and um, yeah, it's less important to, to be able to point to a specific model or a specific library I'm using. Um, I, I think also that it's important to think about, so we, we think about modeling a lot, and those are all tech, tools and techniques related to that. There's also very different types of data scientists now, right? So you've got your machine learning engineers, in which case you need to be really good at the software development side of it. You've got um, people that are data and analytics translators, meaning that you know, your strength would be communicating technical concepts to the business and translating business problems back into analytics problems. And so I think it's really important also just to make sure you're not just saying, I, I, wanna, I want the tools for data science, but I want the tools to be this kind of data scientist. I want it to be the tools for this, to be this kind of asset to my organization. Yeah, I, I, I think that a lot of um, organizations are trying to get there right now or getting close. I think there'll always be a continuum though, right? So there will always be, you, you want everyone to be literate in being able to look at different types of visualizations and think about data in terms of how I can actually use that to make a decision rather than just saying what's already happened. So I, I think from that perspective, um, I do see a future where just about everybody in an organization needs to be able to at least use data to directly influence decisions they're making. Now, does that mean that you need to be able to, um, you know, go in and optimize a, uh, you know, a, a convolutional neural net? No, it doesn't. There's going to be people to do that. So having that whole continuum, making sure that the whole organization is speaking the language of data, and then that also helps then to make sure that when you get to that point that you say, I've taken this as far as I can, now I want to build this out. You, you got the right language to go to who, the data scientist in your group, to go to whoever it is, uh, the analytics representative and, and uh, state the problem to them in a way that they can then carry it forward, right? That you're not having to totally stop and start over when you move from one part of the organization to the next. Yeah? Do you have a quick thing that I can share with my coworkers and people that I'm trying to tell about this? Do you, like, how do you tell somebody that has no, knows nothing about data science? Is there a video that's like three minutes long that you can share with somebody? <laughs> three minutes of uh, video of data science. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hmm. What, I guess the question would be, uh, what's the best way to encourage your coworkers to learn about data science that's not taking a one-day course or something? Like that? Yeah, well, so I don't know if this directly answers that, but I find that the best way to convince people is to, um, to, to, to solve a really annoying problem for them. So not necessarily go all the way and say, you know, I'm going to automate some process for you completely or, or, you know, I can do this better than you, right? Everyone's going to balk at that. But if you come in and say, all right, you, um, every day, you go through and you have to read through 500 emails. And out of those 10 are emails that actually matter to you. Can I, you know, with a couple weeks of work, give you something that says, well, I know half of these emails don't matter, right? And not, not talking about spam, right? Can you right? make that for me right now? Right now, right. <laughs> well, so, so we've done that, right? So we, we, we worked with a supply chain organization where it wasn't spam, right? They were all legitimate emails. But a lot of the emails were, hey, thanks, right? Or, um, you know, your order will be delivered as planned. Okay, but what I need to find out is the one where it says the price has changed, is this okay? Or this part's no longer being manufactured, right? So that was about six weeks of work to get it to, uh, for them it was a production rollout, right? Um, but I don't know, it's, it's, I think that's, that's often a way to do is to find those, those annoying daily problems and just say, I'm just gonna make your life easier. Now do you believe in this stuff? So, yeah, that's a great way to frame it. Yeah, so maybe not three minutes, but. Six weeks. Six weeks, three minutes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, I, I would love to hear, though, if other people, if anyone else has a suggestion on that, I would love to hear it. So I'm going to open that one up. Uh, sorry, it was, uh, for, for convincing or, or uh, communicating the value of analytics and getting people convinced that it is something they should learn and should be familiar with, is there a quick, easy, compact resource to point them towards? Yeah, that's great. Did everyone hear that over there? So the suggestion was uh, to, to find books for them that are written not for, you know, not technical books, things like prediction machines. Um, that are uh, good resources that show them how um, these tools and these techniques are, are revolutionizing things that are really real to them. Um, thanks. All right, I'm going to cut it there for now. We'll have time for more questions later, but I want to hand it off before I give it to Sean. Though.